we're still having a good fight in terms of, yeah. <laughs> I think, us progressive educators trying to convince people who are kind of more from authoritarian versus democratic perspectives mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the value of that for schools and for kids especially. Right, and it, right. it's interesting. We have a community board at the School Without Walls now that I'm on, despite being retired, they've recruited <laughs> me in there, you know, to help them kind of, because they've gone backwards a, a, a good deal in terms mm. of they've retrenched, I think, in terms of some of the traditional authoritarian aspects mm. of schools. So I'm working with them on that, but the question came up the other day in community board, what are we going to do about the issue of Trump versus Biden and all the sub-issues that are connected with that that may have an impact on our kids? Because we have right. immigrant kids here. Right. We have kids whose parents may not be able to vote because of the voting restrictive restriction mm. laws. We have all kinds of things that are going on if Trump were to become victorious and whether or not that's an aspect of authoritarianism versus democratic thought and mm -hmm. and uh, and implementation so how do we deal with that especially if teachers are concerned that it may cause too much disruption in the classroom right. or whatever kind of reminds me of the old tinker versus des moines supreme court case in terms of whether or not kids ought to be allowed to wear armbands and right. talk about anti-Vietnam issues mm -hmm. in which the school said basically you know the Constitution does not stop at the schoolhouse door right. you know, there right. should be Famously, yeah. availability of kids and unless there's you know specific indications that there's going to be violence no you can't stop it because it might be but so anyway right. that right. issue of authoritarianism versus democratic behavior I think is not only reflected, I think, with this, within this election, but it also becomes more prominent in terms of, well, let's look at ourselves. You know, right. John Dewey right. said, you know, it's not preparing kids for society and for democracy. Schools are democ democratic That's institutions. Right. Right. So let's, let's deal with that stuff right here in terms right. of how democratic are we versus authoritarian. Right, so, right. Yeah, you know, and that, kind no, of that's interesting sidelight. Yeah, exactly. I mean that that's that's one of those central issues th that that kind of spans <laughs> all the way from the schoolhouse to the state house. The default in our society seems to be more authoritarian. And and there's a principle actually that that called subsidiarity that is the opposite. Subsidiarity means that decisions should be made at the lowest possible level in an organization. And so it, it actually came out of Catholicism. But it's it's a principle that, you know, really like the uh, I was just reading yesterday about how Jonathan Haidt, psychologist, um, I forget where, but um, he and and a guy named uh, Lukanievich or Lu, Lukanioff, um wrote a book, Coddling the American Mind, I think it's called. Mm. And uh, and they were talking about how a lot of what goes on in social media is exactly the opposite of what you would learn in therapy as positive ways of dealing with things mentally. So so it tends towards catastrophic thinking, like worst first thinking is another way of saying it, um, or, or black and white thinking, is, there's no gray. And a healthy human mind tries to mitigate against those ways of thinking because they tend towards ill health, mental, mental ill health rather than well-being. Mm -hmm. And so part of what, what a controlling system does is it tends to kind of create this default to distrust and, and control, which we know from self-generation theory is exactly the opposite of what, of what is actually conducive to human well-being. So subsidiarity is an organizational principle that I think is, is I, I think it's important to have a word for it <laughs> uh, because it's a lot easier to point to it and say, well, we should be thinking about subsidiarity. How you uh, achieve subsidiarity actually changes depending on their context. So 
a small school of 50 kids and, and, and four or five adults is going to necessarily look different than a school of 250 kids and, and what probably a, a dozen or so adults um, is necessarily it and and being embedded being a private school with its own little board where the kids actually serve as the board <laughs> versus you know having a, a bureaucratic being embedded in a larger bureaucratic organization that actually has you know lines of authority and and decision making and re, re, uh, answers to a legislature that that has n the kids have only theoretical access to <laughs> uh practical access might be different is is you have to recognize that those are different things and so it's a, an ongoing question is what does it look like for us to yeah. you know to push decisions as low as we can go and in some cases you know when you have 250 kids some of those decisions are happening at a teacher level not as a student level now one of the ethics it sounds like one of the kind of principles in the community is is we need to you know give the kids the opportunity to chime in on on the major decisions is that the teachers aren't just going to impose they're going is there's a an, a deliberate mitigation of the tendency to control as opposed to just defaulting to it yeah and, and that's that's another thing that i think i was just making notes this morning as i was waking up is that that's a property i think of of the agentic schools is that that there has to be a mechanism to undermine the tendency towards control is it has mm -hmm. to be explicit and it has to be deliberate I and mean, it sounds like the way you've described it is that that that's an active part of how schools school without walls actually works well how we're trying to move back in that direction and right, uh, right. it's going it, to it's a real challenge it's it's very interesting in terms of the work that we're uh, myself and a couple of alumni teachers are uh, are doing and we're involving other people as well but mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the, the couple of the things that you mentioned in terms of having a larger school and trying to be as democratic as possible is that i used to t in terms of relationships and learning from one another in terms of the consortium schools, the 30 odd schools that exist now. Our closest school that works like School Without Walls is the Ithaca Alternative School. I think mm. it's called the Layman Alternatives, our Layman Community School. And so I hire a bus and we take about mm. 50 kids down to Ithaca to spend the day with their school. Nice. And we noticed that at their town meeting that they had maybe 250 kids you know, in the room, and it worked very well. Hmm, and interesting. The, we came back, and the kids would all say, you know, not all of them, but some of them would say, hey, how, how come we don't do that? How come we just hear the problem in mm. the town meeting, and then we go back to our extended classes to have more in-depth discussions about it? And I said, well, think about that. I said, think about who was in that room, and what, what were they like for the most part? A, they were all white. Mm. B, if you could do a little investigation, they were all middle class for the most part. So they had pretty much all the same values. School Without Walls, you've got the Islamic group. You've got the the black hip hoppers. You've got the kids who want to be here, who are of color, but they're really struggling. Mm. you got the white liberals. you got the skateboarders. you got the... Uh, LBG uh, QT group, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a lot of different groups that are struggling for power and recognition and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's important that they all have some airtime and uh, right. ability to participate. So, you know, our method, you know, it's certainly not like uh, in a uh, New England town meeting, but right. <laughs> uh, or what happens in Ithaca, but it's the best, you know, do you th can you think, I think we posed the question, what are the advantages to doing it our way? You know, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, okay. So that was right, a way right. of taking the student perspective, but again, kind of building in a structure versus control. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it, it, it was happening, uh, even though we didn't call it self-determination theory. Right. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important 
than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr.